Are you using building thinking classrooms in class and have a hard time getting your lessons started when you're designing them? Stay tuned and I'm going to show you a couple of tips that hopefully will help. Hi, I'm Aaron Hayes and I teach here at West Chicago Community High School. We've been using the Building Thinking Classrooms framework for the last two years and have found it's fairly helpful. We also remember how daunting it is kind of in the beginning to go ahead and get started with this. Um, I've been using the non-permanent vertical surfaces for about eight years prior to this. And so I thought it would go through and kind of share through it. This is a recent lesson that we did for our algebra two classes, though you can use it wherever. And I'll kind of talk through the design stages of what I did to kind of come up with it. And then from there, I'll show you the lesson and tell you some tweaks where you can maybe get some good questions in for the students or places where I ran into a couple of bumps. So to get started. So first of all, um, the lesson that we're doing is going to be on rational expressions. So when I think about setting up um, simplifying rational expressions, a couple things come to mind. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I'm talking about taking like x squared minus 7x minus 18 over x squared plus 5x plus 6. And if I break this down and we factor it, the simplifying is going to be dividing out that x plus 2. Okay, so those would go away and we'd be left over with x minus 9 over x plus 3. Now, normally I will talk about what the domain restrictions on this. I'm not going to do that in this first lesson because, again, we don't want to get our students' feet wet. So as I'm thinking about this, the two prior, the things that they need to know prior to this is obviously simplifying fractions. That's going to be one that they can probably do very easily on their own. Now, so you also know prior to this, actually immediately prior to this, we just did an assessment on factoring. Um, and again, and we went fairly deep, but again, that's going to be something that some students are more comfortable with others. But those are going to be the two prior ones. And so I need to probably in my lesson do a little bit of both of those separately to kind of get those. I found that if I do them separately, um, it helps students feel more at ease when I ask them to take the big jump. So from there, I'm going to ask them to simplify a fraction or a ration that's going to involve some factoring. I'm probably, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head, maybe something like a 2x plus 10, and then down on the bottom, I'm going to do something simple. I want them to factor, but I don't want them to feel stressed about factoring. So at least initially, I'm probably not going to include a leading coefficient. So maybe, I don't know. So you have something like even that should work. So then the x plus 5s will drop. From there, I'm going to try to do... Um, a multiplication problem. So from there, I'll probably do, I don't know, probably a quadratic. And then maybe, I think another GCF might be good over a quadratic. So I'll do a quadratic and then maybe like a GCF thing there. And again, so again, it's going to take a little bit more time. The kids are going to have to rely on each other a little bit more. But it shouldn't be that much different from this first one. So notice what I'm doing is this is kind of loading prior knowledge. And that's going to help kids get comfortable in my experience. And then we're going to take small steps. So this first one is that you're going to see is not even that much of a big step from simplifying fractions and factoring. And then this is going to be my next step. Now, the one thing that I haven't done much of this year, or I haven't done much in the past, but I'm trying to do more this year, is I'm going to try to do a debrief. And so I'm going to have my students go through and kind of come up with something and just kind of talk about something that they're taking away from the lesson. Um, because I need to get back, I need to get that habit of going from there. And then what I've also found is I'm going to have them do one more example. Um, and then, so these will go in their notes. So um, these will be at seats so that that way they can kind of pull it off. Now, the other thing that I was thinking about is that if I do multiplication here, oops, popped up too far. 
if I'm doing multiplication here, I may want to review dividing there so that we can remember to flip the fraction that we're dividing by or flip the rational that we're dividing by. Um, so again, then that'll be set up for their homework. So, so again, this is going to be kind of my setup for here. Now, what the actual lesson looked like is this. Okay, so let's take a look and see what the lesson actually turned out to be. So when I first came in, I have my students go through, and they're going to go through and do this class. Notice here, I'm saying without a calculator, that makes it a little bit harder for many students. I've got an adding problem here so that they have to find common denominators. And then as I said over here, notice I've got my division problem over here so that we can go ahead and give some review that way. So then from there, what's going to happen is I'm going to have them go into groups. So notice, remember I said I was preloading the two. So I'm doing one that's very, should be fairly accessible. They're going to do on their own. I'm going to put them in groups for factoring because again, there's some of the students who are not sure about the factoring. I want to make sure that they have some support and not feel defeated right away. In terms of that, I give them a very simple GCF one right away. Um, so again, to drive home that because that happens a fair amount in rationals and I find that students forget to do that. I give them this one, the difference of, or the sum of perfect cubes, because that way everybody's going to have to talk a little bit about it because that's an easy one for people to forget or just memorize it for the test and then forget about it. And then down here, I'm going to give a basic one, just a regular one. And now, again, I know I said I wasn't going to put a leading coefficient on them, but again, I want them thinking in the right way first, and I won't worry about that quite so much when we get into the lessons themselves. So at this point, They've reviewed the two big ideas. So then I usually say something that's like, okay, so now that you factored and now that you've done fractions, what could be more fun than putting them together? So I put this up on the board and I just say, go for it. Most of the time they remember to read the directions, they factor and divide out the common factors. The thing which I like about the way that I did this one is that this here obviously goes to this. And I don't have many students who have a problem with that part dividing out. But what it does allow me to do, and this is something that's a little bit more subtle, don't feel like this is something you need to do right away, but if you can, when I have students or groups that finish really quickly and I go over and I check them, I can toss this question here. I would say something to the effect of, okay, great. So first of all, why can't I switch? Why is it okay to divide these out? And usually they say, well, you can switch the positions. They don't say additions commutative, unfortunately, but I take what I can get. And then I would usually say, so what would change in terms of how you do the problem if I had subtraction there instead of adding? And then I walk away. And I usually hear some good discussions there. I usually, if I have time, circle back to see what they come up with. But that's one of those things that, again, you could push kids on the upper end. And it's a useful tip to know that, oh, I'm going to have to factor out a negative. But again, it gives you a little bit more time so you can still challenge students and then kind of come on back. And then... The second problem that I'm going to have them do in groups is this. Now, I've kept it multiplying so it's easy. So that way we don't have to worry about flipping um, the rationals into their reciprocals. Now, because I'm doing an honors class, I did end up doing leading coefficients. Um, it does lead into an interesting discussion. Most of the time, kids will go through and do this and come up with the answers here. Um, but then it does allow for an interesting discussion about how you can use these two factors to see if I can factor this. Okay. So that would be something else that you can think about. So again, I have the groups through that. And then usually once everybody kind of has had stuff, they've had a chance to work and most of the groups are starting to finish up. I usually will say, okay, group three, great. Go have a seat. Group four, have a seat, that type of thing. And then I, that way, as I go through and I do it, then I can work with the groups that need a little bit more help. And plus, it also then clears up the board so that I think others, the students who need some help can see better. And then once I get the students back to the seat, this was my prompt. I need to work on it a little bit. And a lot of times, a lot of our kids use um, Cornell notes. And if you're not sure about those, I can make link to one down below. In the bottom is kind of a takeaway where you can kind of process things. And so I have a fair number of students who are used to doing that. So it's just a matter of teaching the rest of them. Um, and then here, I give them this one for their notes. And again, now notice since they're working by themselves, I do scale it back 
So there's no coefficients in the front there just to keep it this. Again, I'm focusing on process. I'm not grading factoring. I'm grading do you know how to simplify rationals? And then from there, we had maybe about 10 minutes to start working on homework. I had probably two thirds of the class who felt fairly self-sufficient on this task. And then I could go around and help everybody else. Anyway, so then the next day where I'm going with this next is if you saw the previous video, we have learning cards where the kids will kind of then process it and put it formally um, into some notes that they can keep a setup. So that's how I go through. And it, it took maybe about 15 minutes. When I come back here real quick, I forgot to talk through timing. So my plan here is that this part here took maybe five minutes. This was probably about another five minutes. And this was five. So they averaged about five minutes each. The kids were up at the board probably 15 minutes, no longer than 15 minutes. We took another 10 minutes down by, um, with the rest of it. And then we had time to work. So hopefully you find that helpful. Um, and again, um, I hope you find it as effective as we do. So if nothing else, we'll talk to you soon.